we are going to be discussing more about the Brown families, faith, beliefs, and church. The show Sister Wives has pretty much glamorized polygamy to say the least. And since the show aired and soared to success, many people have came out and discussed their own experiences. Now, I do have a few videos coming up with Christine Brown's cousin Liz. And these videos are very interesting, so be sure you stay tuned for those. In today's video, I want to put together a little background of Liz and who she is, how she grew up, and I appreciate her trying to tell everybody the difference in like the mainstream LDS and the Mormon, mainstream Mormonism, the AUBs, all the different sects. I enjoy the people and appreciate the people who actually take the time to explain it and differentiate it. You get what I'm saying? So, let's give it over to Liz. Now, Liz is ruling all red's granddaughter, just like Christine, that's how her and Christine are cousins, but I'm gonna let her take it over, okay? And we were taught that it's very much in tandem with the mainstream LDS church, this AUB, their, their job, their main goal, at least while I was growing up, was to keep polygamy alive until Christ comes again. And mm -hmm. then um, their jobs are to teach the mainstream LDS church how to live polygamy again. So we were kind of supposed to be waiting in the wings until Christ comes again. And then because we were um, keeping the celestial law, the, the um, higher law alive, doing that through living polygamy, then we would be able to teach that to the mainstream LDS. So I grew up going to public schools. I think a lot of people have misconceptions of polygamy, especially from the media. If they don't really dive into it, they assume the ones that kind of get the most attention is Warren Jeffs and the FLDS. Mm -hmm. And we were separate from them since the 1950s. We really have not been too associated with them. So I grew up going to public school, um, wearing regular clothes. We didn't have to dress anything weird. Our hair was normal. We very much blended into society. And that's a lot how the AUB is now. Um, if anyone has ever watched <laughs> Sister Wives with Cody Brown, um, they come from our group. And I am related to Christine Brown, the one that had just um, left him not too long ago, at least in this past season. I don't mm. watch a lot of it because it's very similar to how I grew up. It's not really my cup of tea to watch. Um, yeah, but that is, that is the religion that I grew up in. And my older siblings know Cody Brown and the wives very well. Um, they had grown up with them. Cody's been to our house. So I was quite happy in my childhood for a very long time. And when I was 16, I had an older sister who decided to join the mainstream LDS church. And I kind of followed her through that process. And the thing that was so interesting about it is though I wanted to join at 16, I had to wait until I was 18 uh, because when you're coming from a polygamous background to go into the mainstream LDS church is actually, uh, takes a long time. It's a long process and you have to go through a lot of steps. One of them being you need to meet with one of the 12 apostles. So it was kind of a fight to, to be able to join the mainstream LDS church but I didn't have to escape. There was no huge drama. My dad was disappointed. My mom was sad, but there was, that was about it. There wasn't any huge, I didn't get kicked out of the house. I didn't lose my family. They were still very loving. So that's kind of where I came from. Um, it, it is so similar to the mainstream LDS church that when I first joined mainstream LDS, I would, I would sometimes have to check with people like my friends or my spouse, um, and ask them is, is this teaching from mainstream or is this something I'm, I'm remembering from like polygamy background and they would kind of have to walk me through it. And that's huh. when I was all in the mainstream LDS church for a very long time. Um, I was baptized at 18 and I think I left in my mid thirties, um, oh, wow. 
mainstream LDS. So I was, and I was quite happy in the mainstream LDS church too, because I was really good at just listening and obeying and following. I really trusted the leaders. I really trusted the information I was getting um, because I wouldn't understand why anyone would be deceitful or not truthful. Mm -hmm. So I was quite happy in both. I didn't leave because I was dis was, I was disenchanted with either of them. Yeah. I just left because it felt like I was following my inner compass. If you know a lot about Mormonism, there is so many branches of Mormonism and the mainstream LDS church that's in Utah that uh, people call Latter-day Saints, um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, they have really tried to distance themselves from the many breakoffs and branches that have come from Joseph Smith's quote unquote restoration of the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, one of them being the church of Christ that's back in Missouri. There's um, so many breakoffs of Mormonism mm -hmm. that oftentimes when I am vacillating between all the different branches of Mormonism, I have to be more specific on who we're dealing with. Hmm. Uh, because mainstream is kind of came from the Brigham Young, um, got rid of polygamy, gave the blacks the priesthood in the 1978, 77 era. They, they did all these things that, and it has the largest following, but mm -hmm. that is not, that's not all Mormonism is. I grew hmm. up Mormon my polygamous background is Mormon, um, FLDS, you could call it Mormon. There's so hmm. many branches, so many breakoffs that when I'm, when I'm so vacillated in between all of these different Mormon worlds, I have to make sure I differentiate between yeah. them. There is such a deep seated belief in the patriarchy and, you know, having the priesthood, if that, if they had the same beliefs as Mormons with the priesthood, and that's why men were the ones that had multiple wives and what the mentality was there to that, that was the everlasting, what did you call it? the everlasting covenant to actually get into the celestial kingdom? Can you share a little bit of what your knowledge is with that? Yeah, it's definitely a uh, patriarchy and it really has to do with the temple covenants. And I mean, it's section 132. I think oftentimes when mainstream LDS people learn about um, section 132, they like to go, well, it's about temple covenants. It's about, that's how you have your celestial marriage. That's, and it's, it's, it's part of it, but, but really 132 had to do with um, Joseph Smith justifying taking on more than one wife. Um, mm -hmm. And then that is what's going to um, bring him into the celestial kingdom. I mean, if you really dive into the early history, historical documents, historical um, information about early church, the main, if you're getting all of your information from mainstream LDS, they are covering those things up because it's, um, it, it's an embarrassment and they want to say that that was just a small section. I mean, how many, if you think back, did you even know that Joseph Smith had multiple wives until probably the last 10 years? Like I, I always knew that. Yeah. But it was something that wasn't really talked about. No, it wasn't. And, and when I got married, my husband didn't know that they're not teaching that in Sunday school and mainstream LDS. Um, but it, it follows right along the lines of patriarchy and the priesthood and mm -hmm. that the more wives you have the higher and and they're in in their frame the woman is helping the man get to the celestial kingdom and they have to do it together but really it's the man that holds all the power i mean they teach that priesthood power binds what is in heaven here on earth or what's here on earth in heaven so you really have the power of God here on earth. That's what mm -hmm. the priesthood power is. So if they're sealing you with the priesthood power here, then that's going to transfer up into heaven and you're being sealed up in heaven. If mm -hmm. you don't have the priesthood power, then yeah, you can get married here, but that doesn't mean you're going to be married in the heavens. That's kind of the, one of the selling points of the LDS church is the, um, that if, if you get married here in our church, then you'll be guaranteed to be married in heaven. Mm -hmm. You get to be with your family forever. So, but that comes through the male line that comes through the patriarchy and women are, especially now, not able to do that and not really having those, those privileges, those priesthood powers. And 
um, it's very much delve into patriarchy. When I was very young, I did ask my mom and dad. I mean, I remember sitting at the kitchen table and asking, well, if, if um, dad can have lots of wives and I can have lots of husbands, right? And, and it was obviously very shut down very quickly um, mm -hmm. because it only goes one way. Uh, priesthood only goes one way. And um, you could say it could come from like the culture of the 1800s. I think that definitely put a um, big role in, in why it turned out the way it did. I mean, women mm -hmm. for so long have been suppressed and taken advantage of and really been identified as less than a full human. Like, yes, mm -hmm. you're human, but not like you, you really can't have all the roles and responsibilities. I'll do that for you. Um, you're and here so, to be a help meet. <laughs> yeah. It, well, yeah. And it's like, it's a big burden, but somebody's got to do it. Well, and it can't be you. So, so I'll make sure I do it. I mean, um, I think, I think it absolutely has to do with patriarchy and priesthood. And that's just, uh, was definitely more well-defined when Brigham Young took whoever would follow into a territory that, um, didn't have a lot of white settlers. Of course it was inhabited, but it didn't have a lot of white settlers. So he kind of got to curate the rules and the context and how people um, worked and function. So it, it's a it's a weird thing because I was quite happy being mainstream LDS. I married a wonderful person and we had a wonderful life. I was able to have all the kids that I wanted. We never had any fertility problems. I fit quite well into my ward. Um, I was friendly, outgoing. I, I worked really hard on all of my callings. I was in the young women's, in the primary, in the nursery. I was Relief Society president at 29. Like I was in, mm -hmm. um, and I had no reason to question or want to be out. There wasn't. And so the best way, the simplest way for me to describe it is um, my dad became the leader of the AUB in 2014. And so I guess that's when it happened was 2014. Mm -hmm. um, he became the leader and I didn't care because it's not my prophet, it's not my right. leader. He was just a really crappy dad growing up and um, just very disengaged and just not very friendly and whatever, I didn't care. So when he became prophet, that was fine. Um, but one of my older siblings, older sisters came to me and she said, um, she was actually no longer in the AUB either. She's completely out non-religious. Um, but she said, I'm having these like really weird flashbacks of, um, a temple ceremony that I was involved in when I was eight. And she said, I remember wearing a white dress and walking into a room with a bunch of other little girls. And, um, there was very inappropriate sexual acts, um, mm -hmm. being done. And I, and she said, and I, I think dad was there. Mm. And, and I, and I just was like, I would never discount what she went through, but she was having like very weird flashbacks and, and she couldn't remember all of it, but she definitely remembered it. And having my dad become prophet really had triggered that for her. Um, and knowing the trauma that she had gone through, knowing that she is, she would never lie about something like that. Yeah. It really made me stop and think about trying to put my dad in a leadership position and taking advantage of the power that he had. And it really drew a through line for me from my dad to my grandpa Rulin, to Brigham Young, to Joseph Smith. And I started seeing this consistent pattern of men abusing their powers and taking advantage of the people around them. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't deny any longer that my dad is not any better than Joseph Smith. And, and I, it really jarred me and I couldn't go to the temple anymore. And the temple used to give me such um, comfort and calm. So I was in the stake primary at the time. And so I knew this, the stake president pretty well. 
Um, and I could tell that I was starting to, every time I saw the temple or heard the te- about the temple, mm. I would start getting this really visceral reaction. Um, just very upset over what my sister had gone through. And so I went to him, I'd been crying for weeks and I went to him with my husband and of, of course, cause he's the priesthood holder. Right. And I said, um, I, I've had this incident happen that my sister told me about. It's making it really hard for me to want to go to the temple. I, and I'm crying at him and he turns to my husband and he said, you know, what should we do? And my husband was like, that's why we're here because you are the, like, you have dominion over like the stake. Like Mm -hmm. that's why we're coming to talk to you. And he goes, well, um, you should probably just go to the temple and sit in the parking lot until you feel better about it. And that was another thought stop. I thought, wow, that's, that's what your advice is. So you, so you're the, that's okay. Mm Okay. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. I'm going to have to figure out how to get over this on my own, because this man who claims to know to get revelation for his stake clearly does not have revelation for me. Yeah. So um, I went home and I really just did a big deep dive. I did a big deep dive on Joseph Smith, on church history, on Um, all of these different assets, aspects of Mormonism. And then I saw all the problems that were there before that I was just unable to see before. Um, Mm -hmm. But really the through line was watching these charismatic, so fun, so great men take advantage of their power over people. And, Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and of course there's, there's all the other things, LGBTQIA issues, um, racism, um, you know, obviously the doctrine, just <laughs> so many different things that I have an issue with, but really the main thing was the, really the, like the string that pulled the sweater was my dad becoming the prophet of the AUB that really had nothing to do with me. You know what it seems like to me that these men that believe in polygamy mainly believe in just having their face out there and just being famous basically i mean that is literally what i get out of all these interviews from all these ex-church members and it's very telling and it fits cooter brown to a t i'm talking to a t It explains why he is the way he is. Does it not? It does to me. He thinks he is the chosen one. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Y'all, let me know what you think in the comments below. Like I said, I got another video coming up where Liz talks more in depth. More in depth. About an interaction she had with Cody and Robin recently. Y'all are going to laugh. You are going to crack up so much when you hear how Cooter and Robin acted. (laughs) Y'all, it ain't going to surprise you. But you are going to laugh. You're going to laugh, I promise you. So stick around. Thumbs up and share this video. I really would appreciate it. Y'all smash that subscribe button. Click the bell beside subscribe to all. That way you'll be notified whenever YouTube sends out notifications. I've got so many videos lined up that are so, so good. I just hope y'all stick around to watch them all. I love you for watching. I will see y'all in my next video.